I'd like to introduce Professor Levin Vandenberg. Uh, most of you know him as Vandenberg of Boyd and Vandenberg, uh, the authors of the book Convex Optimization. It has 40,000 citations according to Google Scholar and is used in uh, nearly every department, certainly in the IOE department here, to teach uh, convex optimization. Um, the way I know him was as my own convex optimization professor at UCLA, where I did my master's degree. I feel very lucky to have learned from him uh, because he's an excellent teacher and, and speaker, as you'll see today. Uh, and in fact, he won a teaching award from the School of Engineering and Applied Science at UCLA. Um, and I'm sure he would have won many times if they are allowed to give it more than once. Um, also, he won the career award at the beginning of his career and since then has had several NSF awards uh, to do research in semi-definite programming, conic optimization, and different methods. And all of them with applications in controls, signal processing, uh, early on in circuits and VLSI. Um, and so is, you know, uh, really someone who brings the tools of optimization to, to applications and studies uh, the way to, to solve problems in those particular contexts. So thank you for coming, Levin. Thank you for that answer. Uh, introduction. Uh, I'm Levin Sin uh, Jung is a current uh, PhD student. So the topic is uh, sparsity in semi-definite programming. A uh, semi-definite program is a uh, convex optimization problem that is defined uh, like this. So the uh, optimization variable is an n by n symmetric matrix X. So in this talk, n will always be the order of the matrix variable. We have a linear objective and linear uh, equality constraints and they're expressed as um, uh, using the inner product, the trace, uh, standard trace uh, matrix inner product for symmetric matrices. And the inequality denotes matrix inequality. So it means X has to be positive semi-definite. Uh, so it's uh, similar to a linear programming, standard form linear programming problem, but generalized to uh, matrices. And it's been uh, widely studied since the early 90s when people uh, first developed interior point methods and extended interior point methods for linear programming to this more general class of problems. And um, roughly speaking, we can um, classify the applications in uh, maybe three groups. Um, the most obvious ones are applications where matrix inequalities and positive semi-definite constraints uh, arise naturally. For example, in control, uh, they were studied because if you optimize or try to um, compute a um, uh, quadratic Lyapunov function, then that's defined by a positive semi-definite matrix. In uh, machine learning and data science, the um, common uh, examples of this are covariance matrices. If you want to estimate a covariance matrix subject to uh, constraints, uh, moment matrices, um, for example, a gram matrix in a Euclidean distance matrix problem, those are all uh, types of um, applications that naturally lead to uh, semi-definite constraints. Uh, a second big area of applications that's still uh, being developed very actively until uh, today is uh, in relaxations of non-convex um, uh, quadratic and polynomial optimization problems. And um, there semi-definite programming arises because if you take the dual of an, uh, the Lagrange dual of a quadratic optimization problem, you get a semi-definite programming problem. So the Lagrangian relaxation of a quadratic uh, general non-convex quadratic, op quadratic optimization problem is a semi-definite programming problem. And that has been extended to a uh, non-convex polynomial optimization problem. And there are uh, systematic ways of uh, developing hierarchies of relaxations, SDP relaxations for solving these problems. And maybe the uh, largest set of applications in um, uh, terms of the number of SDPs that are solved daily is inside uh, modeling packages like CVX or uh, YALMIP or uh, CVX-PI um, because um, 
these types of packages transform a general convex optimization problem in a standard form. And uh, the most general standard form they use is an SDP. So they convert every, uh, almost every problem you uh, specify to an SDP or a second order cone program. And then, but that's completely transparent to the user. So the user doesn't see the SDP. So in many of these applications, the problems uh, can be uh, very large. And in this talk, we are interested in exploiting sparsity in semi-definite programming. And by sparsity, I mean the uh, sparsity and the coefficients. So we are interested in problems that are um, that the matrix variable that can be large. But the matrices C and AI, all the coefficients in the problem are very sparse. And the difficulty uh, in solving uh, or exploiting that uh, structure is that uh, in general, even if the coefficients are very sparse, the solution matrix X or even any feasible X must be dense in order to be feasible. Because uh, to get a feasible positive semi-definite matrix, X has to be dense. So you have an N by N dense matrix of uh, variables. So that's a difficulty in scaling um, semi-definite programming solvers in many of these uh, applications. And then in this talk, we'd like to uh, s discuss different types of structure that are um, in X that result from this type of sparsity and that help in scaling uh, in zero points, um, any types of algorithm, in zero point and other types of algorithm. Um, so one, um, property we try to exploit is that if you look at the problem, so you have a dense matrix variable X, and you can distinguish uh, two types of variables in the matrix X. So there are entries in X that are important in the uh, cost function and in the constraints. So the entries are, are uh, multiplied with non-zero coefficients in the constraints. Those are in some sense the real variables in X. And the other variables are free um, to some extent, but they only have to exist to make the, make the matrix positive semi-definite. So even though the matrix is uh, dense, it has some, uh, it is, uh, only a sparse subset of the variables are really uh, important. And to see that that's important in, uh, or matters in scaling uh, algorithms, uh, we can look at a very simple example. If you assume that the um, coefficient matrices, so the C and the AI are all uh, banded with the same bandwidth then it's only the main band and the variable X that's multiplied with these uh, coefficients, and, but in general, X still has to be a dense matrix. And then if you look at the uh, cost of solving a problem for a fixed bandwidth as a function of the dimension of the matrix N, with the standard uh, SDP solvers that uh, date from around 2000, but are still the most in commonly used uh, SDP solvers today in packages like CVX, then you see the complexity for uh, a fixed number of uh, constraints, M, and a fixed bandwidth scales as N squared, which is actually uh, very good because you're solving an N for an N by N matrix of variables. But it's also a little disappointing because you would expect that uh, if you fix the bandwidth for a small bandwidth, that it should be linear in N if everything else is uh, fixed. And as an extreme case, uh, if you compare it with a linear program, which you can interpret as the special case of this problem and the di matrices are diagonal, then if the number of uh, uh, constraints is, um, uh, equality constraints is fixed, then the cost as a function of the inequalities is linear. In, in, right? um, so this is sort of fundamental in the, these types of primal dual symmetric solvers uh, that are implemented in these packages. And we'll see by exploiting the sparsity, in this case, the band structure, we can reduce this complexity to linear in the dimension of the matrix. Uh, as a more uh, practical example, that this uh, comes up in um, um, important source of SDP applications these days is in power flow optimization problems. Uh, in those problems, you are interested in solving a in, uh, very non-convex uh, quadratic uh, optimization problem. Um, and I'll just here summarize the non-convex part of the problem, or the difficult non-convex part of the problem. So we have um, the variables are uh, node voltage in a network, a power distribution network. So at each node or each bus, you have a complex voltage as a variable. And then you also have a power flow inside each link or each line in the network. 
So SIJ could be the power flow from I to J, node I to J in the network. So there are two types of uh, non-convex uh, constraints. So you have upper and lower limits on the voltage, absolute value of the voltage. And the lower limit is a non-convex constraint on that complex variable. Right? If you represent a complex variable as a two vector, it would be a non-convex uh, lower bound. And the second uh, constraint is flow balance equation. So for each line between nodes I and J, you can look at the power of flow from I to J and from J to I. And because of losses, the sum is not zero, but the sum is related to the difference in the voltages uh, via this uh, quadratic equation. So it's uh, the sum of the two power, uh, complex power flows is uh, the square of the distance between VI and VJ. So that's a non-convex quadratic equality constraint. And then, of course, there are many other um, uh, constraints that uh, are usually easier. So in convex relaxations, you uh, deal with this by replacing with a very common trick in um, semi-definite programming applications. So you lift the variable to a matrix variable. So instead of using V, the complex vector of node voltages as variable, you use V times its um, complex uh, conjugate transpose. Or in this case, the real part is switching. So you introduce this symmetric matrix X as a new variable. And then in that matrix, if you use that matrix as a new variable, then these two quadratic non-convex constraints become just linear in X. So the bounds on the voltages at each node become upper and lower bounds on the diagonal elements of X. Uh, these constraints that uh, look also like a distance constraints between points in R2, that these types of constraints turn into linear constraints in the matrix variable. And uh, so except for the, um, and then this matrix must be positive semi-definite. Uh, that's implied by this. And it's only a relaxation because uh, you can only go back from X to V if the solution of the problem is, uh, has rank two. In this case, rank two because it's a complex uh, variable. Um, so if you use this relaxation of this li uh, lifting idea, you get an um, SDP. And it's also very sparse, and that's the point uh, that's interesting here. And if you look at which entries in X are important in the variable, then there are the diagonal entries appear in, all the, in some variables. And then the variables X, I, J, for which there is a link connection between nodes I and J. So the sparsity of the uh, SDP, as I defined it, the sparsity in the coefficients, will correspond to the topology of the uh, power distribution network. So in that sense, it will be a very sparse SDP. And that's been studied by um, several people um, for about 10 years. And uh, there are st efficient solvers that try to exploit this type of sparsity. Um, so in this talk, we'll uh, look at um, actually three techniques in parts two, three, and four. And I'll start with some introduction on uh, chordal graphs and sparse uh, matrices and properties of sparse, from sparse matrix theory that are very useful in semi-definite programming uh, algorithms. So we'll uh, represent sparse mat symmetric sparse matrices by an undirected graph, as is uh, very common. And it's useful to say exactly what the graph represents. So the, it's the absence of an edge between two nodes that gives you the information. So if there is an ab no edge between two nodes three and four, then it means that in the matrix, the three, four, and the four, three element must be zero. The other elements may or may not be zero. The diagonal elements are not necessarily uh, non-zero. They could or may or may not be zero. And if there is an edge between two uh, nodes, that means that that element is also might be non-zero. Um, so E will always denote a sparsity pattern or equivalently the uh, edge set in this undirected graph. And this definition also implies that if a matrix has a certain sparsity pattern, like this matrix has this sparsity pattern, and if you add an edge between two uh, vertices in the sparsity pattern, then the mate, that's also a valid sparsity pattern for the same matrix. You can always extend the sparsity pattern by making or adding edges in an existing sparsity pattern, unless it's completely dense. Right. So that's called an extension of the sparsity pattern. Um, and the notation I'll use is this. So this stands for the symmetric matrices of order N with sparsity pattern E. So E is the edge set in the graph. 
And then another point in terms of notation is that when I use the term click, I'll always uh, define it as a maximal complete subgraph. Whereas in graph theory, actually, it's usually defined as just a complete subgraph, not necessarily maximal. And in the, uh, so a maximal complete subgraph or a click in the sparsity graph corresponds to a uh, maximally dense principal submatrix in the sparsity pattern. So for example, uh, 135 is a click in the graph that corresponds to this uh, three by three dense principal submatrix in the sparsity pattern. And again, dense in quotes because these uh, dense just means that these elements may or may not be uh, non-zero. Uh, they're not necessarily non-zero. Uh, so that's the notation we'll use uh, for a general sparsity pattern. And then a chordal graph has, is an undirected graph that has uh, the following property. as a property that every cycle in the graph of length uh, uh, greater than three has a chord, which means an edge uh, linking uh, non-consecutive vertices in the graph. So this is not chordal because there is uh, this cycle of length four and it doesn't contain a chord. If you add an edge between A and C, for example, then it becomes chordal because uh, now for every cycle of length uh, four or more, you can always uh, take a shortcut and uh, using a chord. So it means that every cycle can be shortened by taking a, a shortcut to a triangle. And uh, so in graph theory, that's called a chordal graph and some other terms are triangulated graph. In machine learning, decomposable is a very uh, common uh, term in uh, graphical modeling and it goes by other uh, names as well. So chordal graphs have a very long and interesting history because uh, they've been uh, discovered and rediscovered in many uh, fields and in many applications. Um, maybe the first was uh, combinatorial optimization in the late 50s because they're known as a, um, uh, examples of perfect graphs. And perfect graphs are graphs for which a list of um, combinatorial optimization problems that are very uh, difficult in general are actually very easy. Like graph coloring, finding all the clicks in a graph, um, um, and so on. Yeah. So in the case of a chordal graph, those problems are actually extremely easy because they can be solved by simple greedy methods that I won't discuss except maybe the, the property that the clicks are easy to enumerate will be important for our applications. So the most important uh, uh, applications will be in linear algebra, obviously, and they, uh, that was also discovered in the 1960s. They come up in sparse factorizations, as we'll see. And then in the 1980s, they were studied in uh, all types of completion problems. Um, there is some connection with database theory in the 1970s. In machine learning, they're known as uh, decomposable graphs in uh, graphical modeling. And in nonlinear optimization, there is an important application and when studying partial separability in nonlinear optimization and trying to represent partial separability as a graph and then exploiting the uh, structure in that graph. And in semi-definite programming, the first use of choral uh, graphs and sparsity was, is from 97 in the, uh, this paper. Um, so the main... Uh, uh, property of chordal graphs and chordal sparse matrices. That's the basis of much of the properties we'll use. Uh, this was also developed in the 1960s by Rose. And the connection is this. If you take a uh, positive definite matrix with a sparsity pattern E, and that's our notation again, define a uh, Scholesky factorization like this. So P is a permutation matrix. L is a lower triangular. D is a positive diagonal matrix. Then the chordal graphs, if E is chordal, then there exists a permutation matrix that gives you a factorization that has essentially the same sparsity pattern as uh, the original matrix. So you can factorize it with zero fill. There exists an ordering or an elimination ordering P that gives you zero fill if the sparsity pattern is chordal. And it's actually almost uh, if and only if, because if E is not chordal, then you can always find uh, examples of matrices, positive definite matrices with that pattern for which um, you don't have a zero fill uh, reordering. Uh, so that's a very practical definition and it gives you some idea of how common or how exceptional uh, this choral structure is. 
Um, so there are some um, sparsity patterns that are very simple and we know have um, a zero fill Cholesky factorization. For example, a banded matrix, this positive definite can be factorized with a banded uh, Cholesky factor. An arrow pattern that's actually very useful in uh, robusty squares and matrix normal uh, optimization and so on. And that also means that this is maybe the simplest choral sparsity pattern, just two overlapping dense blocks. So if you take a Cholesky factor, you get uh, two triangular uh, dense blocks with the same pattern. And this is also a very useful pattern to actually study first in developing properties and algorithms for choral graphs, because if um, a property or an algorithm works for this simple choral pattern, then usually it can be extended to more general choral patterns using uh, three structures that I'll uh, discuss. And then uh, you can also um, more generally obtain a choral pattern uh, by just taking a, a sparsity pattern of a Cholesky factor. So if you take a general sparse matrix, symmetric sparsity pattern like this, so the uh, filled circles are the non-zeros. If you take a Cholesky factor, then you get a fill-in. With this order, you get a fill-in in these positions, the open circles. And that filled pattern, so this sparsity pattern of the Cholesky factor is by definition a choral sparsity pattern. And that's a systematic way of finding a chordal extension. Um, and you can apply that to any sparsity pattern and then extend the sparsity pattern in a chordal uh, sparsity pattern by uh, a symbolic Cholesky factorization. And uh, often you can do this with a relatively small amount of fill-in. So many sparsity patterns, for many sparsity patterns, there exists a reordering where you have an, uh, ex uh, an efficient uh, chordal extension. So that's the basis of the success of sparse uh, Cholesky solvers in uh, sparse uh, matrix algebra. Uh, so any Cholesky, uh, any sparsity pattern of a Cholesky factor or any permutation, symmetric permutation of su such a pattern is a choral pattern. And then in uh, uh, matrix theory, people have uh, developed very efficient methods for analyzing these sparsity patterns. And one of the most um, useful uh, data structures associated with a chordal sparsity pattern is an elimination tree or a supernodal elimination tree. And this is an example. So here we have a uh, graph or a sparsity pattern or only the lower triangular part. So every dot represents an edge in a sparsity graph. On the right, you see uh, a tree and the nodes in the tree are the clicks in this uh, graph. So four, six, seven is a click. 5, 6, 7, 8, 10 are clicks. And the two rows and each click um, are defined as uh, the top row is the intersection of the click with the click that's the parent in the tree. And the bottom row is the remainder after the intersection. And choral graphs have the nice property that you can um, form a click tree or a supernodal elimination tree um, like this, where the uh, tree has the property that these uh, bottom rows in each block, these are called the supernodes, form a partition of all the vertices in the graph. Um, so that immediately gives you the property that in a choral graph, the number of clicks is always less than n, because these rows form a partition of all the nodes in the matrix. Uh, so this is a click tree on the right. These blocks are numbered. So the supernodes are just these block columns with a column, uh, common uh, block sparsity structure. And many algorithms for um, um, sparse matrix uh, operations can be formulated as recursions over three structures like this from um, in topological order, starting at the leaf nodes and working to the root or inverse topological order. And many operations or many problems can be solved using recursions like this because um, you can also show that a click tree of an um, chordal graph has the property that the um, clicks that contain a given vertex form a subtree in this graph. That's the induced subtree property. So if you look in the click tree for all the clicks that contain a given vertex, for example, 10, then they form a subtree of the this click tree. And the fact that they have this locality of vertices in clicks in this click tree makes it possible to solve many 
uh, matrix uh, computation problems in a recursive uh, algorithm. Uh, just uh, in a, going through these clicks in topological or inverse topological order. Um, so uh, now if going back to SDP, so we look at uh, three properties of coral uh, sparsity patterns that are uh, very useful in uh, semi-definite programming algorithms. And um, so the first one is we'll, um, if you have a given sparsity pattern E for a uh, symmetric matrix, we can define two cones of the symmetric matrices with that sparsity pattern. For example, E could be a band with a certain uh, bandwidth. So banded matrices with a uh, certain bandwidth. So the first one is the positive semi-definite matrices with that sparsity pattern. For example, tridiagonal matrices with, uh, that are positive semi-definite. And we'll uh, just use this notation. It's the intersection of the matrices with that sparsity pattern and the positive semi-definite matrices. The second uh, cone is the matrices that uh, have that sparsity pattern and can be completed to be positive semi-definite. So geometrically, you can write that as the projection of the positive semi-definite matrices on the subspace of matrices with that sparsity pattern. And so you project a dense positive semi-definite matrix on the tridiagonal matrices by setting everything outside the three diagonals equal to zero. So we'll use uh, this notation for that projection. So this is a positive semi-definite matrix cone with a given sparsity pattern. These are the positive semi-definite completable matrices. And then you can show that in general without assumptions on the sparsity pattern E that these cones are convex. They're closed pointed, they have non-empty interior and they're also duals of each other. So they form a pair of dual cones in the space of uh, uh, sparse matrices. That's true for a general sparsity pattern. And if it's the sparsity pattern is uh, coral, then you can characterize these two cones in a very uh, simple way. So first, the cone of positive semi-definite matrices with a coral sparsity pattern uh, has this uh, simple decomposition. So if you take um, this example, it's a, a coral sparsity pattern with three overlapping dense blocks. So matrix of this form is positive semi-definite, if and only if you can write it as a sum of simple matrices like this. So each of them is zero except in one of these uh, maximal clicks. So obviously if you have a decomposition like this, it means the matrix is positive semi-definite. But for a coral pattern, it's if and only if you can also, for every positive semi-definite matrix, you can decompose it like this. And that's just the meaning of this general uh, sum. So you write it as a sum over all the clicks in the pattern, and each um, um, for each click you have a possibly dense positive semi-definite principal matrix in that position. So that's a theorem that uh, uh, was discovered in the 1980s in nonlinear programming. It came up in uh, papers on partial separability for. Um, and it actually follows from the zero fill uh, Cholesky factorization property that um, I mentioned, because a Cholesky factor will actually give you this decomposition. So if uh, just the idea of the proof is uh, clear from this simple two by two example, so we want to show that every positive semi-definite matrix with this structure can be written as a sum of two matrices with a simple structure. And that follows from the Cholesky factorization because if you factorize a matrix like this, you get a Cholesky factor with zero fill. And then if you um, interpret this product as a sum of outer products and group the um, columns in these two parts, then the first uh, columns in the Cholesky factor will give you this dense block. The second one will give you this one. So from the Cholesky factorization, actually you obtain this decomposition. And it also comes as a byproduct. Actually, if you do a multifrontal Cholesky factorization, you actually compute these matrices. So that's a very useful uh, property in optimization because it uh, means that this uh, complex cone, convex cone, can be decomposed as a sum of very simple cones. And that's a nice structure in large scale optimization. Uh, so I mentioned that the, uh, this cone of positive semi-definite uh, sparse matrices is the dual of the cone of completable matrices with that pattern. So by duality and the first decomposition result, you also get this uh, famous result that an 
Coral matrix has a positive semi-definite completion if and only if each maximal clique defines a positive semi-definite submatrix. Um, so again, this is a necessary condition if this uh, has a positive semi-definite completion, but it's also sufficient in the case of a coral sparsity pattern. Uh, so this is also very useful in large-scale optimization because it allows you to write this uh, complicated constraint that a large matrix is positive semi-definite as an intersection of uh, much simpler uh, convex constraints. You have a set that's written as an intersection of simple sets, and that's a very useful structure in large-scale uh, optimization. So as an example, um, you can look at uh, this uh, problem. It's not quite an SDP because it has a quadratic objective. But suppose we have a matrix A, a sparse matrix or dense matrix A, and we want to find the nearest uh, positive semi-definite matrix with a given sparsity pattern or the nearest matrix that has a positive semi-definite completion. So that's useful, or both problems are useful. For example, X could be a uh, covariance matrix that you estimate from partial measurements, and you want to find the uh, smallest correction to your measurements that gives you a matrix that has a positive semi-definite completion, so it's a valid, uh, can be completed to a valid covariance matrix. And those are actually uh, dual problems because of the duality between these two cones. So projecting on one cone is actually the same as projecting on the other cone and then subtracting from X. Right? So in the first problem, you project on the cone of positive semi-definite completable matrices, or you can project A on the negative of the cone of the uh, positive semi-definite matrices, and they're essentially the same problems or they're dual uh, optimization problems. So in general, if the N is very large, uh, these are difficult problems because to project on a positive semi-definite cone with a sparsity pattern is expensive. And even projecting on a dense positive semi-definite cone for large N is uh, very expensive. But these decomposition results allow you to uh, decompose that in much smaller uh, projections. Uh, so if the sparsity pattern is coral, then by this decomposition result, we can express the cone of positive semi-definite completable matrices as an intersection of uh, simple matrix constraints, each for only one clique in the sparsity pattern. And then we can project on the intersection of the, these constraints. And in our scale optimization, there are many algorithms that are actually uh, well suited for um, problems like this. So Dijkstra's method is a famous method that solves uh, projections on an intersection of convex sets by a sequential projection on each of the sets. And that's equivalent to dual block coordinate descent. Uh, FISTA, or projected gradient methods applied to the dual would work on this structure. And then more generally, you can have ADMM, Douglas Ratchford splitting. And in all these methods, the cost per iteration is reduced to a projection on a smaller symmetric positive semi-definite cone. So if the clicks in the matrix are sufficiently small. These are just small, dense eigenvalue decomposition. And um, these are some uh, numerical results. Um, N is the size of the matrix. These are some, the first table gives you some statistics of the sparsity patterns. Um, so the size is important, but also the density, the number of clicks, and the size of the clicks. So that means that to solve one of these projection problems, we can just project on a smaller, dense, positive semi-definite uh, matrix cones of size of, uh, given by this. So there is small dense eigenvalue decompositions as opposed to an eigenvalue decomposition of this dimension. And then all these uh, methods can be used and the complexity per iteration is, all, is very similar because they're dominated by these small uh, dense uh, eigenvalue decompositions. So this uh, technique has actually been uh, used uh, extensively in semi-definite optimization problem, in decomposition. So if you go back to the semi-definite programming problem, and we assume that the matrices have a common sparsity pattern, and the sparsity pattern is coral, and we can always extend it or assume that without loss of generality, then you can write that problem equivalently um, as a uh, conic optimization problem with a different cone. So instead of the dense positive semi-definite cone, we define this cone K as the positive semi-definite completable matrices with the common uh, sparsity pattern, the common sparsity pattern of all the coefficients. 
because the entries in X that are important in the co cost function and in the coefficients are the entries in E, the sparsity pattern. The other entries are um, less important. They only have to exist to make X positive semi-definite. So that means that the entries in the sparsity pattern must be such that they have a positive semi-definite completion. So it's a small change in variables uh, in notation, but the uh, dimensions are much smaller. This could be a very low dimensional cone, for example, banded sparse matrices. This is a dense n by n cone. And then uh, this clique decomposition uh, results allow us to replace this constraint that X has a positive semi-definite completion by small, um, smaller um, dense, uh, a set of smaller matrix inequality constraints. So that's been used um, in several uh, algorithms. So actually, um, it's been used in interior point methods in the early papers on exploiting uh, sparse, uh, sparsity and semi-definite programming. So in this uh, formulation, you reformulate the problem in this form. You have these inequalities that are smaller, but they um, involve overlapping blocks in X. So you have to add, uh, you can write them as separable constraints if you add uh, consistency equations. So you set up a uh, much larger SDP, but with smaller uh, inequality constraints. And then if the sparsity pattern is uh, nice, you can actually sometimes solve this larger SDP much more efficiently than the original one. So it can be used in interior point methods, but it's even uh, more obvious in first order and uh, splitting methods like the uh, projection example I discussed. And there are some, a uh, lot of recent work on this. There's also a solver that uses this decomposition method uh, in an ADMM uh, implementation for large sparse uh, SDP. So that's the first um, um, set of um, techniques from uh, sparse matrix theory. So the uh, application of these two clique decomposition uh, theorems for positive semi-definite and completable sparse matrices. Uh, the second one is um, uh, different. So we go back to the SDP again and the dual. Uh, we've seen you can reformulate the standard SDP as an uh, conic optimization problem. If you replace the dense positive semi-definite cone with a cone of uh, positive semi-definite completable matrices, X. So again, X here is a much lower dimensional variable. It's a sparse matrix. Here, X is a dense matrix. And then in the dual, uh, you get the dual of this cone, which we've seen is the positive semi-definite uh, matrix, matrix cone with that sparsity pattern. So you no longer have a symmetric uh, set of primal and dual um, conic optimization problems. You have a primal and a dual uh, conic optimization problems, but with different cones in the primal and the dual. But the advantage is that the dimension of the space that you're optimizing over, the dimension of X is much lower. Um, <coughs> so the, you no longer uh, have this nice self-dual and symmetric primal dual methods that are implemented in the standard solvers for SDP, but you can still try to solve this uh, non-symmetric or non-self-dual pair of conic optimization problems using uh, non-symmetric um, primal or dual interior point methods. If you can, um, for example, if you apply a barrier method, you will uh, need efficient methods for evaluating the barrier functions for these two cones and their gradients and hessians. So if you look at the gradients, uh, the barrier functions for the two uh, cones and the computations that are evolve, involved in uh, calculating the barrier functions and the gradients and the hessians, so if you start with a positive semi-definite cone, the obvious barrier function is just a log dead barrier function for on the positive semi-definite matrices. With again the distinction that here we restrict it to the sparse matrices with that sparse pat sparsity pattern. So it's the standard log dead barrier restricted to uh, matrices with a given sparsity pattern. So the gradient of that barrier function is um, the projection of the uh, negative of the inverse of S. So if, if, for example, we consider an, um, a band pattern E, then the inverse of a positive definite matrix with that pattern will be a dense matrix. But the projected inverse is actually the main band of that dense inverse. And that's all you need to um, know the gradient of the barrier function. If you're interested in the computing only those 
entries of the universe that are in the original sparsity pattern. And then the Hessian is uh, more complicated, but you can express the Hessian as the directional derivative of the gradient in a direction. And then to evaluate the, um, this directional derivative in a direction y, you have to evaluate this expression. So you take the dense inverse S at which you evaluate the barrier function, pre and post multiply with the direction. So you get this dense matrix, and then you have to project on the sparsity pattern. So those are the general uh, operations we need in these barrier calculations. And for coral sparsity patterns, you can actually evaluate all these um, um, matrices very efficiently by a recursion over the click tree. So that's the difference between coral and then a general sparsity pattern. And that's, uh, so I'll of course skip the details, but that's actually uh, on a high level, um, maybe not surprising. If uh, we recall the fact that for an, a sparse positive definite matrix with a coral pattern, we can evaluate the Cholesky factorization very efficiently. For example, using a multifrontal uh, algorithm from the 1980s. And that's how you would evaluate the barrier function at a given S. You take the Cholesky factorization, and from the diagonal elements, you get the value of the barrier function. And the uh, multifrontal method would if, uh, do this by uh, via recursion over the uh, elimination tree, supernodal elimination tree, or just standard elimination tree. So by um, the principle of automatic differentiation or the chain rule, it also means that if you are interested in the gradient of this function, you should be able to evaluate the gradient in a similar recursion by just applying the chain rule to the algorithm that you use to evaluate the value of the barrier function. And that's true. If you work out the details, you get a uh, multifrontal algorithm that computes the elements in the projection of this inverse, only the elements you need and none of the other elements, or, uh, via a recursion in the inverse topological order in the elimination tree. And then for the Hessian, you have two recursions, one from uh, in inverse topological order and the other in the uh, um, topological order. And another interpretation of this inverse algorithm is that if you write the Cholesky factorization in this way, and we solve for the entries in the inverse of S that we're interested in, so that uh, the entries in the sparsity pattern, you can actually obtain them uh, from this equation in a very nice uh, algorithm. So the, in terms of uh, complexity, uh, in this graph we take um, a large set of sparsity patterns from the uh, University of Florida collection. So these are just some statistics about the sparsity patterns, the number of, uh, the order of the matrix, the number of uh, non-zeros in the matrix. And here we compute, uh, compare the time for each sparsity pattern of a Cholesky factorization of that sparse matrix with that pattern, or the, and the cost of computing this projected inverse. So the entries and the, the dense inverse of the matrix that you um, need in the projected inverse. And the point is that it's almost uh, identical. So the cost of computing a gradient is almost the same as the cost of the uh, Cholesky factorization for that sparsity pattern. Um, so that's for the cone, the first cone of positive semi-definite matrices and the evaluation of the barrier for that cone. Then by uh, duality, we can also uh, find methods for computing the barrier function for the positive semi-definite completable cone. And that's very closely related to uh, maximum determinant completion problems. So there, if you have a matrix that has a positive definite completion and you want to evaluate the barrier function for the cone, which is defined as the conjugate of the barrier function for the dual of this cone, then in that calculation, you actually need to solve an optimization problem that can be written like this or as a maximum determinant completion problem. So you take the matrix at which you evaluate the barrier, you evaluate the maximum determinant positive definite completion, of course, that's a full uh, dense matrix, but its inverse is known to be sparse. And you can evaluate the inverse or a Cholesky factorization of the inverse very efficiently. Again, if the, coral, if the sparsity pattern is coral. Uh, so it's a little more complicated than the first cone, but the conclusion is the same, that the cost of evaluating the uh, gradient of the dual uh, barrier function is very comparable with the cost of a Cholesky factorization for the same sparsity pattern. 
And uh, so once you have the barrier uh, functions and the gradient and the hessians, we can implement a uh, primal or a dual barrier method using these barrier functions. So uh, we, uh, Martin developed a solver based on this in his thesis. Um, so you get an, um, something that has linear complexity per iteration for simple patterns like band or arrow patterns. As you saw in the beginning. And uh, these are some examples of uh, large sparsity patterns that he tried where um, you get large matrices, but they're also very sparse. And then we generate random problems with a uh, fixed number, small number of uh, constraints. And then uh, using these techniques, you, get, you can solve them actually to much higher dimensions than using the standard solvers that are used on, uh, most of them based on primal dual uh, interior point solvers. Um, and then maybe in the last uh, minutes of the talk, um, I'd like to say something about uh, another very useful consequence of coral uh, sparsity. Uh, so we mentioned uh, the importance for positive semi-definite completion problems and the, um, uh, the maximum determined positive definite completion. So in general, the maximum determined positive definite completion for a general sparsity pattern is a convex optimization problem. And it's uh, particularly easy for a coral sparsity pattern. Uh, but in many applications, you're not interested in the maximum determined completion, but in the minimum rank positive semi-definite completion, especially in applications where, uh, that are based on relaxations of um, uh, non-convex problems. Okay. Ideally, you would like the uh, solution to be rank one. But if you solve the relaxation, you might have a higher uh, rank in your optimal solution because the optimal solution is not necessarily unique. So in general, uh, you would like to find a minimum rank completion. And in general, that's a very difficult problem for a general sparsity pattern. But for a coral pattern, it's still uh, very easy. And the minimum rank in the positive semi-definite completion of a coral pattern is simply the largest of the ranks of these um, dense um, principal submatrices uh, defined by the cliques in the pattern. Uh, so, um, and that's the result again that's been, uh, has a long history. I think this, this is the first paper I know that mentions this result, but has been used also and mentioned several times uh, later. And um, there exists also a very simple uh, algorithm for computing this minimum rank uh, completion. And uh, maybe you can skip the details, but again, you would start with a two by two simple coral sparsity pattern. So we know already that it uh, has a positive semi-definite completion if these two dense blocks are positive semi-definite. And uh, we, uh, you can show just uh, by construction that there is a completion that has rank equal to the maximum of these two ranks. And that's clearly the lower bound because any completion must have at least the rank uh, equal to the maximum. Um, so we always also included this in a, a library that we have for um, of functions for um, coral sparsity matrices. Um, so there's a very simple algorithm that allows you to construct this for the two by two block case. And then using these uh, click trees, you can extend it to a general sparsity pattern uh, by applying this two by two, uh, this two block uh, construction recursively for every, uh, uh, as you uh, enumerate the vertices in the click tree. Um, but this fact also has uh, very interesting implications for large sparse uh, SDP. Because if you look at an SDP and you assume that the sparsity pattern again is very sparse, then it means that every feasible X, every feasible X, and certainly every, the optimal X, can always be replaced with a uh, completion of the projection of X on the sparsity pattern. You can keep the elements in X that are multiplied with non-zero coefficients in the C and AI. And then all the entries can be replaced by uh, other values as long as the matrix is positive semi-definite. So you can always uh, choose any positive semi-definite completion of this uh, important part of X. And this result about the minimum rank completion uh, means that there's always a completion of rank um, at most equal to the largest click size in the matrix. So if the largest click size is R, then you can always replace X without loss of generality 
with a rank R positive semi-definite matrix and parameterize it like this, for example, X is Y, Y transpose, where Y has R columns. And these are equivalent problems. So this is a quadratic non-convex formulation, but it's equivalent to this uh, original one. So if this largest clique is actually, it's very small, this is a useful, useful um, generalization. Uh, it's related to the nonlinear uh, methods, um, so the famous methods by Brewer and Montero, that solve a general SDP by, uh, where the, um, by replacing it with this nonlinear uh, parameterization. And in these methods, usually the number of uh, columns in Y is an upper bound or an estimate or an upper bound on the rank of the optimal solution. Um, here it's slightly different because it means you could actually uh, replace it equivalently. Every um, feasible solution can be replaced without loss of generality with a matrix like this where the number of uh, columns in Y is the maximum click size. It's not just the optimal point. So if you do it for the optimal point, you restrict the feasible set to a non-convex feasible set. Here you actually uh, have an equivalent parameterization of the original problem. And uh, this is also useful for uh, rounding um, SDP solutions or SDP relaxations because in many, we've seen many approaches where we solve a large sparse SDP by using these decomposition methods and first order methods or um, other methods based on this click decomposition. But then at the end of the um, um, application, you still have the question of uh, finding the matrix X, the optimal matrix X itself. So you're interested in finding, an, um, uh, and then the problem is that the optimal solution of the um, SDP is not necessarily unique. So you would like to um, construct the minimum rank, uh, a low rank solution of the SDP. And um, this simple um, low rank or minimum rank completion method gives you a way to do that. So this is a small example where we try that on some of these power flow problems. Um, so this is the size of N, the maximum click size, and then three solvers. The first column shows you the rank computed by the uh, SDP relaxation, which is, um, uh, that's the first column. And then we apply the simple minimum rank completion to this solution and find a lower rank solution. We can think of it as a rounding of this solution to a low rank solution. So in many cases, or the first case, that's one. So you have an exact relaxation, even though the solver returns something of higher rank. And that's related to the fact that this uh, interior point solver will typically find, if there is an optimal set, the maximum rank solution, because it's the uh, central point of the optimal, uh, analytic center of the optimal set, the, com the limit of the central path. Um, so to summarize, so we looked at uh, different applications of uh, results from sparse matrix theory that all relate to coral graphs in uh, SDP algorithms. In different types of algorithms, so they are very useful in uh, first order splitting methods, uh, interior point methods, also low rank factorization methods. And um, so um, solving large sparse SDPs is still uh, a challenge but I also think there is still um, progress to be made in uh, solvers for um, exploiting this low dimensional structure from sparsity or low rank in um, that results from the sparsity in the coefficients. So thank you. is very difficult, but there exists also very good heuristics. 
for finding uh, that are used in Cholesky, sparse Cholesky code for finding a solution with uh, low feeling. And is there a problem on the topology if I just Yeah, I don't know. pattern and then you do the um, a chordal extension and then you can there exist very efficient methods for finding the clicks and this in the uh, this filled sparsity pattern is there a ways toward just larger number of smaller clicks uh, yeah, yeah. Very, um, uh, you can get um, and as um, these, some of these tables show you can have find sparsity patterns that have a very large number of very small clicks. And then these are applications often efficient to merge smaller clicks and treat them as a larger clicks. always extend it to a coral pattern. Maybe not the most efficient extension, but it's always equivalent to the original problem. So there's no loss of, um, it's exactly equivalent to the original problem. And the other example I mentioned where we project on the positive semi-definite complete yeah. cone, yeah. there it's important. If the, you want to project on a pattern that's not uh, coral, then you may have to, you can extend it to a coral pattern, but then you have to force the uh, zeros in the original pattern by adding equality constraints. And you can still do that using ADMM if uh, you know, the number of those additional zeros is not too high. Uh, but there is not equivalent. 